California chaparral. This wonderful shrubland biome is the ecological heart and soul of this great state, and I am incredibly lucky to have grown up surrounded by it. Sadly, it does not get the credit it deserves among Californians, and many people outside of California haven't even heard of it. I want to share why this ecosystem is so fascinating. So, to show you all this biome has to offer, I've teamed up with Rick Halsey of the California Chaparral Institute, an educational nonprofit dedicated to preserving the chaparral. But before we explore the many wonders of this ecosystem, a little background info is necessary. Chaparral is a shrubland plant community found in California and parts of Southern Oregon and the Baja California Peninsula. The chaparral is characterized by a Mediterranean climate, meaning it has mild winters and hot, dry summers and infrequent but high intensity crown fires. The chaparral contains 9% of California's wildland vegetation and 20% of its plant species. What we're in the middle of right now is California chaparral and there's some coastal sage scrub here also. The hard, thorny plants you don't want to walk through because it's <laughs> difficult, impenetrable. That's chaparral and there's a lot of characteristic plants that people know about. Manzanita, for example. Some of the other ones like ceanothus, people call them wild lilac. Uh, see, uh, uh, chemise. Then the softer stuff out here that really has this great aromatic sensation when you walk through it, minty. That's your coastal sage scrub or California sage scrub. And there's a lot of fun plants there. There's white sage, black sage, there's some buckwheats. So it's all interspersed here. And interestingly enough, this location in Encinitas, California has some of the most rarest plants that you can find on the coast. And maybe we can see some a little later. You may have noticed that Rick and I are standing in the exact same spot, but the area around us looks very different. This is because the portions of the video that Rick is in were filmed in August during a very hot and dry stretch, and the parts of the video that I am in were filmed in January after a long rainstorm. The amount of water available completely transforms this ecosystem every year. Some of the most interesting plants and animals in the chaparral, it's, it's a list of what California is all about. For example, on the state flag is the California grizzly bear. And the California grizzly bear, its preferred habitat was chaparral. It wasn't forest, it wasn't meadow. They hung out in the chaparral. And they'd make these tunnels through the ceanothus and the, and the chemise. And you'd walk through, and I just can't imagine as a, an indigenous person trying to gather food and stuff, being in one of these tunnels and meeting head on with a grizzly bear. They populated the state in huge numbers. They'd roam in packs of 10 to 20 sometimes, especially after the Spaniards got here with their cattle because that provided a wonderful food source for them. But the characteristic animal of the chaparral used to be the California grizzly bear, which is no longer around, they're extinct. Uh, the last one was killed in Southern California, uh, 1920, uh, excuse me, 1909, 1908. Uh, the last one in California was seen in 1924 up in the sequoias. So they're gone now, and I wonder what the ecological damage that has caused or, or lack thereof in terms of allowing habitat to be formed. Some other animals that are still here, like the California bobcat, the, the, uh, the mountain lion, the coyote, there's a lot of bigger predators still there. Uh, smaller animals wise, there's some wonderful creatures. One you wouldn't expect would be the um, spadefoot toad. They burrow under the ground in areas where there's vernal pools, which are seasonal pools that only hang out for maybe two to three months, but it's just enough time for the spadefoot toes to crawl out of their burrows, lay eggs, tadpoles, and then they do their living uh, cycle, and then they burrow right back into the ground. It's little tiny little tadpo uh, to toads like that. They have little characteristic digging uh, triangles on their hind feet to allow them to dig holes. Plant-wise, the characteristic plants of the chaparral, manzanita with their really beautiful burgundy red bark, ceanothus, a lot of those flower in the February, March uh, time period, beautiful blue and, and, and white colors. Also, there's some other plants. One is called chemise, with a little tiny, tiny, and right there, if you can hear it, is the rentit. That's W-R-E-N-T-I-T. There he is. They have a characteristic call, has a bouncing ping pong ball kind of rhythm. It goes There he is. Anyway, it's the first bird you hear in the chaparral in the morning. It's the last one you hear at night. They live for about a 10 to 11 year period. 
they mate for life. They often have one to two uh, nesting broods, they're called, every year. And they're very energetic. Anyway, that's the characteristic bird of the chaparral. Lots of wonderful insects. One is the tarantula hawk, which flies with these long <laughs> legs out of the back end and these beautiful orange wings. And they hunt tarantulas, which is what the name obviously sounds like they do. And they scurry around on the ground and they'll poison the, the, the tarantula with their toxin in, in the sting. And they'll drag those things for a very long distance and throw them in the, in the burrow, lay their eggs on it. And the tarantula is paralyzed, but the larvae of the tarantula hawks slowly eat this thing and they eat the most vital parts last. So it doesn't uh, kill the animal and it keeps it alive and fresh. Chaparral, which by the way is spelled with one P, two R's. Most people don't get that right. A-L on the end. It's California's most characteristic natural habitat. It's in every single county in the state except Sacramento, and I think it was probably there before humans got involved in the situation. Uh, and as a result, it really provides some of the most significant biodiversity in the state. So it's really important in terms of uh, natural history, and it should be the state's ecosystem, frankly. There, there unfortunately isn't one at the moment, but maybe we can work on that. It's important in California because uh, a lot of the animals and, and uh, plant life that live in the state either live directly in the chaparral or depend on the chaparral for their existence. For example, the California condor. The only reason it's able to live in California or recover in California is because of chaparral, broad expanses of chaparral. One of the reasons there's a lot of broad expanses of chaparral is it's basically impenetrable and it covers thousands of acres with very dense shrubbery. And so people have had a hard time using it. Um, in fact, a lot of people have very negative attitudes about chaparral. They see it as brush. They see it as something we got to get rid of. They see it as unnatural. And in fact, it's probably the most natural thing in California. Um, historically speaking, people have tried to get rid of it through burning, over grazing, uh, and they can actually get rid of it by over grazing, by burning too many times. So the uh, relationship the system has with humans is pretty difficult to uh, kind of tease out because it depends on the group you're talking about. But for the most part, most people have seen it as not a usable thing. And, and the issue with that is that's a human-centric viewpoint. Chaparral doesn't need a reason to exist. It has intrinsic value. And it, the value it has is it provides habitat, food sources and lots of uh, rich resources for for other creatures it wouldn't expect that's what it's for it's to provide a home for a lot of california's most characteristic creatures healthy ecosystems have a ton of benefits for humans they're just not always easy to see or easily commodifiable that being said as rick explained ecosystems should not need to have value to humans to justify their existence they have inherent value anyway. Once we realize this, a lot can change for the better. Another thing about chaparral that's important, it provides watershed protection. And that's uh, an important thing for humans. So that's sort of a what they call an ecosystem service. It's a human-centric kind of viewpoint on things. And so if it rains, the raindrops hit the plants and the plants moderate the raindrops, allows the water to percolate into the soil slowly. and that creates the water table and recharges it. Um, after fires, for example, or when people have cleared the landscape, there's no protection for the land anymore. And so massive flooding, tremendous amount of erosion. So this shrubbery here has a very important role in preserving the landscape in a way that no other land cover could do because trees can't exist here. There's not enough water. Uh, there's too much water for just cacti. So it's sort of in this sweet spot between not quite enough water and then too much water. And so the plants that exist in Chaparral are here because they're especially adapted to the particular climate that we have in California. Chaparral, like a lot of things in nature, is misunderstood. And it's probably one of the most understood ecosystems or habitats on the planet. And it's specifically related to its relationship to fire. When you read articles in the newspaper about fires and chaparral and, and you hear people talk about it, often you hear things like, well, chaparral needs fire. It's made to burn and those kinds of things. Those are sort of human-centric viewpoints. They're not really biologically based or science-based. The relationship chaparral has with fire is very delicate. 
and very specific. So the natural fire return, in other words, the amount of time it takes for a system to recover from fire and naturally regenerate is about 30 to 150 years or more. So if you have a fire in Chaparral and it doesn't occur any more than once every 30 years or so, then you're okay. And the other end of the spectrum, the 150 years plus, if an area hasn't burned that long, what starts happening is you get a whole new wonderful assortment of plant life and, and lichens and things like, you'll get manzanitas with trunks that big. That's old growth chaparral, which is incredibly important for biodiversity in California. Most people don't, don't talk about it that way. They see it as, you know, it hasn't burned in 100 years or 60 years. You often hear that when you hear about fire stories. Well, that's good because the older the chaparral is, oftentimes the more diverse it can be. So what happens on the lower end? If fires start coming more frequently than once every 15 to 20 years, the plants can't recover. They don't have the time to put seed back in the soil, to regenerate the energy they need in their underground rootstock, to re-sprout. And you get down to the lower end, like once more than every 10 years, what happens is the system eventually gets compromised and it gets replaced by non-native weeds, which then ironically make the system more flammable. And that speeds up the flammability and then the fire cycle even more. And so you have fires once every two or three years. So that end of the spectrum, you eventually will eliminate chaparral. So when people say, well, it's, it's adapted to fire, it needs to burn. No, that's not right. What it is, it's especially adapted to particular patterns of fire. So if you change the pattern, in other words, the frequency, anything less than once every 30 years, you're in trouble. If you change the intensity, in other words, a cooler fire, um, chaparral, when it burns, is supposed to burn hot, high intensity, and big. Now, people don't like that because that often takes out homes and, and kills people. So it's something to be concerned about. But then again, <laughs> you don't want to put your home in areas where it's going to be flammable like that. So we don't think of high intensity big fires as natural you hear that often but in fact in chaparral that's exactly the kind of fire that it needs in a sense to recover properly because high intensity infrequent fires it'll take out all the non-native weeds that may be there it scarifies the seeds properly to allow them to germinate so it's it's got a pattern that's got to be preserved in order for it to uh, survive properly look chaparral will burn occasionally this is completely natural, but it should not burn often as this can greatly harm the ecosystem. And climate change is making fires occur much more frequently, giving us yet another reason to halt it in its tracks. And saying things like chaparral needs to burn is completely missing the point. Fires happen, so the ecosystem has adapted to deal with this. And we shouldn't be going in and burning more to keep the ecosystem healthy because this will only damage the ecosystem as the chaparral isn't adapted to more frequent fires. If we can get rid of our human-centric views of nature, it will be for the best because human-controlled nature is harmed nature and harmed nature harms us. A good way to look at it is like fire insurance. Most people have that on their homes. Now we don't say people have fire insurance because they're uh, made to burn every 20 to 30 years, right? I'd lose their home. Now, why do you have fire insurance? You have fire insurance to allow you to recover. So Chaparral has a lot of fire adaptations, true, but the adaptations are there, not because the plants and the system needs to burn, but they have those adaptations because the system evolutionarily knows fire is gonna come. And so it has adapted these systems to allow the system to recover. And it's perfectly fine without burning for a long time. The fire will come. It's just got to come at the right time, which is typically in the fall. It's got to come at the right intensity, which is really hot. And it's got to come at the right length of time interval wise. It's got to be at least 30 years or more. Historically, the chaparral has been demonized because you can't get cattle through it. You can't cut it down and make timber. And so people have tried to get rid of it. And that historical since has been with us for a long time. And so the best way to correct that is to get people out in the chaparral, help them understand what's there, appreciate the biodiversity. 
uh, but a lot of people have this management sort of uh, bias. They think we need to manage chaparral. As a matter of fact, we need to manage everything. And, and it gets to the point where I wonder how nature survived without us. <laughs> it, it, it did quite well, actually. Uh, but we have this need to be important, I guess. And there's a lot of people who make a lot of money managing things. So, you know, you, you find a reserve like this and it's preserved. And people say, well, how are you going to manage it? Well, to be honest, the best way to manage it is just to leave it alone and provide spaces for people to enjoy it in a way that they're not going to damage the habitat. If there are invasive weeds, for example, that's the one management area that can really be helpful because non-native weeds, they don't provide habitat for native animals. Uh, they're actually more flammable than what you see here, the natural habitat. So going in and removing invasive weeds and perhaps planting natives in their place and maintaining a maintenance schedule to keep that under control, that's helpful. But for the most part, it is what it is and it should be left alone and enjoyed so the animals can have their habitat and we can get the benefits of being out in nature. There's a lot of discussion, especially with climate change, what can we do to protect what we have left? And that's a great question. First and foremost, like a doctor, you don't want to cut somebody open to see what's going on in there unless there's a reason to cut somebody open. And that risk is less than the risk of the problem that you're looking at. So when we go and look at nature, we want to basically leave it alone, except for maybe restoration areas that have too many weeds, uh, restoring areas that have lost their native species. But what starts happening is people move a little too far into the manipulation management end and they want to do things. They want to cut down some trees. They want to add more fire through prescribed burning. They want to uh, maybe increase fire frequencies. They want to do something. <laughs> and the essential ingredient to protecting chaparral is just to leave it alone keep people's homes away from it, then help people understand the natural environment in which they live. And that includes either chaparral, coastal sage scrub, or, or, or forest. Because once you identify with an area and you get to know it, all of a sudden it means something to you. It creates a sense of place. The worst possible thing that can happen in the world and with people and friendships or what, if you don't know the thing, you don't know the person. You have a tendency, we all do as, as humans, to create caricatures and biases and stereotypes. And we make things fit our own perception of what it is, and it's often not a good one. So the best way to cure that is to go out and either meet the people you're <laughs> condemning, actually develop relationships with them, or go out in nature and go see the thing that maybe you're afraid of or you don't understand. And all of a sudden, once you develop relationships, those prejudices and biases, they start melting away. And so really the best way to protect chaparral and any habitat is to encourage people to get out, take a hike, get a guidebook, go with somebody who knows what they're talking about and learn about these natural habitats. And then all of a sudden, we'll develop a constituency of people who love those spaces, those habitats, and they'll be the voice for nature and the animals and plants that live in nature that wouldn't be able to be heard otherwise. It is incredibly important to understand how the world around us works, and spending time outdoors can help you accomplish this. So get to know your local nature. Whether a long hike in the rugged wilderness or simply sitting by a creek with your friend, time spent in nature is time spent well.